Man, 24 years ago, I started uh, a ministry called Higher Rock Ministries. It was my traveling ministry for about 20 years full time. And uh, it came from Psalm 61 2, which says, Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. The whole verse says, uh, I call to the Lord as my heart grows faint. Uh, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And I just, I liked it. Uh, it was something that I did for a long time. Even when Micah and I started this church 12 years ago, I was still doing uh, this Higher Rock Ministries for a little bit. And in 24 years of vocational ministry, and so 24 years ago, I would have been 22. And then I started teaching a Bible study at, at uh, our church. Uh, our youth group didn't have a pastor or a youth pastor. And so I was teaching Bible studies at our church from the time I was 16. And so in, in 30 years of teaching, I've never taught what I'm teaching this month. And I am super excited about it, like just really kind of giddy about it. So this month, we are looking at the three places in the Gospels where God spoke audibly from heaven in the presence of Jesus and the, and the witnesses that were there. And they're super cool, and I'm really excited about them, and I can't wait. And so uh, we're going to dive in. Today's message is called God Speaks to the Prophet, the prophet in this case being John the Baptist. God speaks to the prophet. And here's what we have on tap today. For those of you who are new every week, I give us a theology that's kind of our theology text or our theology for the week, our application, and then our prayer for the week. And so it's just an easier way for us to kind of remember some of those things, and they will be up on the screen as we go through them throughout the sermon. But our theology today is this, the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus is the Son of God and the promised Savior. The Holy Spirit reveals that Jesus is the Son of God and the promised Savior. Our application today is this. Every day for us is an opportunity to declare, behold the Lamb of God. Every day is an opportunity for us to declare, behold the Lamb of God. And our prayer today is this. God, we thank you for your son Jesus and the spirit that you have given that reveals Jesus to us. Let's pray and ask God to teach us today, can we? Lord God, we do ask today that you would instruct our hearts we thank you, God, that you have preserved your message through the generations and that the message of Jesus Christ uh, over the, the centuries and the millennia now is, is still as rich and as beautiful as it was the day that the blood was shed on the cross and that the tomb was left empty. And we thank you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for salvation in him. We thank you for righteousness in him and forgiveness in him. And we pray, God, that you would teach us today and that you would cause us to delight in you more fully. It's in your name we pray. Amen. The Holy Spirit reveals that Jesus is the Son of God and the promised Savior. I'm going to begin here in Matthew 3 today, if you want to join me there. We'll be in Matthew 3, and we will also be in John 1 a little bit, if you want to uh, put your finger in that spot as well. Matthew 3, we are introduced to a guy named John the Baptist. John the Baptist is like the second cousin of Jesus. And uh, so John's mom and Jesus' mom are cousins. And John the Baptist famously leapt in his mother's womb when he heard the voice of Mary, the, the mother of Jesus. Uh, and, and John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. It's really, really a cool thing. Uh, and we can talk about that more on Wednesday if y'all want to. Super interesting. All of the family, uh, John the Baptist and his mother and his father, all received the Holy Spirit long before uh, everybody else did. And, and so it's kind of a neat little thing. But look here, John the Baptist speaking in Matthew 3, uh, beginning in verse 13. And this is telling us a little bit about John the Baptist. He's been preaching uh, at the beginning of chapter 3. He's been preaching repentance. He's been telling people to turn away from their sins, to look forward to the coming Savior. And in verse 13, it says this, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so for now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And then John the Baptist consented. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he came up out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened up to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now, all my life, uh, I have just assumed that the entire crowd there, because John the Baptist has a crowd of people along the edge of the river who are listening to his teaching, I've just assumed that the whole crowd heard this. And maybe they did. The Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll see that the entire crowd does hear the voice from heaven. But in this case, it's kind of silent. Because, I think, the point isn't whether or not the crowd heard the voice of God. The point is that John the Baptist heard the voice of God. 
I believe here when it says when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up out of the water and the heavens were opened up to him, that it could be that the heavens were opened up to Jesus, but I think more likely here uh, it's that the heavens were opened up to John the Baptist, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and resting on him. And we'll come to that in just a minute why I think it's John the Baptist. Behold, a voice from heaven spoke and said, This is my beloved Son. With him I am well pleased. Now, Matthew records it for us, Mark records it for us, and Luke records it for us. And in each of these cases, the Holy Spirit has come and has, after Jesus has, has been baptized, the heavens are opened up, and the Holy Spirit, like a dove, comes down and rests on Jesus. And the reason that that's important is because over in John chapter 1, and we're going to come back to this text in a minute, but over in John chapter 1, verses 31 and 32, listen to this. John the Baptist said, I myself did not know him, meaning he did not know who Christ was. He didn't know who the Messiah was going to be. He was preaching that the Messiah was going to come, but he wasn't sure who it was. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he would be revealed to Israel. So the reason that John the Baptist is doing what he's doing, the reason that John the Baptist is out baptizing is so that the Messiah, the Savior, would be revealed to Israel. Listen to verse 32. And John bore witness and said, I saw the Spirit descend on him like a dove, and it remained on, on him. I saw the Spirit descend on him like a dove, and it remained on him. And continue down through 34. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and borne witness then that this is the Son of God. So here's what I want you to understand. John the Baptist is next to the River Jordan. He is baptizing people. He's telling them the Messiah is coming, the Savior is coming. The word Messiah, Hebrew word, simply means the anointed one, okay? Uh, Christ is the Greek equivalent. The word Christ means the anointed one. And so the Jews were waiting for the anointed one, the one who would come and redeem them, the one who would come and rescue them. They were looking for a physical king who would sit on, on a throne and get Rome out of the way. That's what they were looking for. But John the Baptist is baptizing, and he is baptizing with the intent that in the course of his ministry, the Savior and the Redeemer would be revealed. And he says, the one who sent me to baptize, being God, the one who sent me to baptize told me that the one I see the Spirit descend on like a dove, that's the guy. And John says twice in this text, John the Baptist says twice in the book of John here, he says, he goes, I didn't know who it was going to be. He wasn't sure. I mean, at some point, I'm sure he knew who his second cousin Jesus was, but he didn't know. So he's baptizing, waiting for the Savior to be revealed. Now, Jesus has already, in some way or another, kind of marked himself uh, and, and because when he walks up to be baptized, John says, no, no, I should be baptized by you. But John, by his own testimony, says, I didn't know until I saw the Spirit descend on him. So Jesus comes, John baptizes him, he comes up out of the water, and the Spirit of God descends on Jesus. And in that moment, because before John's public ministry, God said, look, go and do this, prepare the way for the Savior, prepare the way for the King, prepare the way for the Messiah, and the one you see the Spirit come on and land like a dove, that's the one who's going to baptize with the Spirit. That's the Savior. And so he's doing this, and he's baptizing people, and he's calling them to repent, and Jesus comes, and he gets baptized by John, and he comes up out of the water, and the heavens are opened up, and the Spirit descends and rests on Christ, and John is quickened in that moment to know this is the guy. And that's why I believe that for sure, maybe the whole crowd heard it, but the statement from heaven, this is my beloved son, with him I am well pleased. That statement, maybe, maybe for the crowds had significance, but for John the Baptist, 100% had significance. Jesus comes up out of the water, the heavens are opened up, the spirit descends on Jesus, and John hears the voice, this is my son, this is the one I'm pleased with. And in that moment, John's ministry changes. In fact, the next day, we'll see that later, uh, the next day, Jesus sees, sorry, John sees Jesus, and he goes, look, guys, it's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Uh, your Bible says it probably more formally than that, like, behold, right, the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. But I, I would like to imag imagine it was a little bit more like in the Greek, kind of like, oh, my goodness, hey, guys, look, that's the guy I was just telling you about. Because what happens is the day after John baptizes Jesus, he's telling people with a little bit more probably passion, not just that the Messiah is coming, but like, dude, I met him yesterday, right? 
And he's excited about it. And he's over here baptizing people. He's like, listen, guys, you got to repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is time. The Savior is here. I just met him. And you can imagine all the people are going, like, who? Like, and he's like, is this guy, is Jesus? We're actually second cousins. It's kind of a cool thing. You know, I don't know what he's telling the people. But here comes Jesus with his entourage. And he's like, that's the guy. That's the guy I was just telling you about. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And the Bible says that all the guys who are following John now turn around and start following Jesus. Some of John's closest disciples were like, man, everybody's leaving us to follow him. And he's like, it's good. John's like, it's okay. That's who they're supposed to be following. I want us to see something here. that The Holy Spirit bore the testimony that Jesus was the Son of God. The Holy Spirit bore the testimony that this guy is the Savior. So John's baptizing people. He's, he knows the Savior's coming. The Savior's coming. The Savior's coming. This is his message. Repent. The Savior's coming. Repent. The Savior's coming. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is almost here. It's at hand. It's, it's right on top of us. He baptizes Jesus. Jesus comes up. The heavens are opened up. The Spirit descends on him. And just to put a punctuation on it, you know, just to, to put a fine point on it, because, like, as soon as the Spirit descended on him, he's like, man, that's the guy. But then the voice from heaven says, this is my son. This is the one in whom I am well pleased. Now, the reason that this matters, I want to show you something here really quickly. The reason that this matters is in John 16, 13, and you don't have to go there if you don't want to, um, but you can just jot it down and look at it later. Jesus, in John 16, Jesus is about to be arrested. In fact, the book of John spends more time on the last night of the life of Christ than any of the other gospel writers. And uh, Jesus is just a couple of hours away from being arrested. And he will be beaten throughout the night and then crucified in the morning. So here's what he's saying the night before he's crucified. Verse 12, John 16, 12, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear to hear them now. Jesus is like, man, I got a lot to tell you, but you, you couldn't stand it right now. And what he doesn't say is, and I'm going to be dead in about 12 hours. That, like, he's like, my time's short. I got a lot of things I want to tell you. I just, uh, I, I got invited to speak this week at, at the FCA at Cristobal. And, uh, and I had 15 minutes. And I got to tell you, like, I have a hard time with 30 minutes on Sunday mornings. I really do. There's a lot more I want to tell you. You've heard me say that. Man, there's more I want to tell you. Uh, I usually feel like I'll probably be back next week. I, I don't feel yet like I'm, you know, hey, this is my last week, I'm going to be dead before next Sunday, you know, like, but Jesus is going, man, there's a lot I want to tell you, and he's going, but oh, I got about 12 hours, and you just can't hear it now, and so he tells him this in John 16, 13, he goes, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you all the things that are to come, and he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you, all that the Father has is mine, therefore I said he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So here's what Jesus said, look guys, it's the last night of the life of Christ, he's got about 12 hours before he's arrested, or before he's crucified, and he's like, guys, there is so much I want to tell you. I just can't tell you right now, but the spirit will come and he will tell you all things. He will declare to you what is to come and he will take everything that is mine and he will give it to you. He came from the father. This is the duty of the Holy Spirit, he says, to reveal to his disciples who Jesus is, what he's done, what he's said. Like the, the job of the Holy Spirit has always been to make Christ known. That's always been the job of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And, and, and so like Jesus is telling the guys Hey, I just need you to know, my time's up. Wish I had more time to tell you stuff, but I'm going to send a guy who will finish the story. One of the things that I grew, I grew up in church, been in church my entire life, I grew up reading the Gospels and like looking at Peter's denial of Christ. If you don't know the story, then in just an hour or so, Peter's going to de deny that he knows Jesus, and he's going to de deny it three times. In about 40 days, Jesus is going to be raised from the, he'll already have been raised from the dead, but in about 40 days, uh, Thomas is going to deny and go, no, I don't think he's been raised from the dead. I need to see him. Like, I, I was taught growing up that when we look at the disciples and we go, oh man, these guys, like, they doubted sometimes. And sometimes they didn't believe. And sometimes, and, and I've, I've heard preachers say, and I'm just going to tell you now, as a 46-year-old dude, it really ticks me off to hear preachers say this, but every now and then they'll be like, look, even the disciples doubted. Sometimes you're going to doubt. No, you're not going to doubt who Jesus is. You know why? Because the disciples didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. And in Acts, when they got the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's job is to convince them of who Jesus is. They never doubted again. 
Because the job of the Holy Spirit is to convince people that Jesus is God, the Son of God, and that he's the Savior. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. And the reason Peter denied is he didn't have the Spirit yet. And the reason Thomas doubted is because he didn't have the Spirit yet. If you bump into somebody who's a Christian who says, yeah, but sometimes as a Christian you're going to doubt that Jesus is God. Wrong. Wrong. We, we are not like the disciples of the Gospels. We are like the disciples in Acts. We have the Holy Spirit now. And when the Holy Spirit shows up, literally 50 days after this day right here in John 16, when the Holy Spirit shows up 50 days later at Pentecost, they never doubt again. They never question again. Why? Because the Spirit's job is to show us that Jesus is the Son of God and that He's the Savior. That's His job. If you flip back a couple of pages, uh, in John 14, verse 26, it says this. John 14, verse 26. Uh, I'm going to begin in verse 25. Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance everything that I've said to you. So the Holy Spirit's job is to come and show up and then remind them of everything that Jesus said. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. The, the reason that you and I have come to... If you're here today, and Micah was hinting at it a little bit, like this elation, it's a good word, we don't use it enough, but if you are elated that, that Jesus is the God and that he's the Savior, and you're like, man, my faith is in him, and I'm, I rejoice in the, in, the, in the blood that was shed on the cross, and I rejoice in the empty tomb, those are things you have come to know because the Spirit of God has revealed them to you because that's his job. He shows us who Christ is. In fact, sometimes people will ask me, what, what does it mean when the Bible says the only sin that can't be forgiven is the blasphemy of the Spirit? Here, in a nutshell, you can find this in all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not in John. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you find this story in the first three Gospels. And Jesus has just cast a, a demon out of a man. And the Pharisees, who don't like Jesus, said, oh, he's only doing that by the power of the devil. He's operating by the power of the devil. And the Bible tells us, listen to this. Let me just read it. This is Mark 3. The scribes came down from Jerusalem and were saying, uh, he is possessed by Beelzebul. They were saying that Jesus is possessed by the devil. And by the prince of darkness, he cast out demons. Jesus called the people to him and said to them in parables, how could Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom doesn't stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house can't stand. If Satan has risen up, against himself and is divided. He cannot stand, but is coming to an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he can plunder his house. Truly, truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, but whoever blasphemies, uh, whatever blasphemies they utter will be forgiven. But whoever blasphemies the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of the eternal sin. Listen, let me explain this to you really quickly. Jesus comes and he casts a demon out of a guy. He's doing that by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible will tell us later in the gospel, okay? He's doing that by the power of the Holy Spirit. The people who don't like Jesus are going, no, no, he's doing that by the power of the devil. I need you to get this. The Holy Spirit's job was to make Christ known as the Son of God and as the Savior. And he was doing that through miraculous things, opening the eyes of, the, of people born blind, raising the dead, healing the crippled, right? Like casting demons out of people. He's doing this. In fact, the gospels are full of places where people say, man, we have never seen anyone do these kinds of things. Why? Because no one had ever been operating by the spirit before like Jesus was. Everything Jesus was doing by the power of the spirit was intended to show the people, hey, I'm the son of God. Hey, I'm the savior. And the moment that people said, that is not from God, is from the devil, they were taking the Spirit's testimony. The Holy Spirit's going, look, guys, it's this guy right here. And they're going, how do we know? Look at all the miracles he's doing, the Holy Spirit says. Look at how he's raising the dead. Look at how he's casting out the demons. And the Holy Spirit's going, son of God, right here, everybody. Right here, Savior of the world. And the moment that people said, I don't believe you. In other words, they're saying, I don't believe the testimony of the Holy Spirit. That's blasphemy of the Spirit. The, the, the people, let me put it in a 21st century perspective. 21st century perspective, maybe it's in church, maybe it's because of a worship song, maybe it's because of a friend, maybe it's because of a, a televangelist, maybe it's because of some sermon on the radio or some book someone's read. At some point, somebody goes, whoa, I think Jesus is the Son of God. I think he's the Savior of the world. That is the Spirit revealing the truth about Christ. And in the moment they say, you know what, I disbelieve that, they are disbelieving the Holy Spirit. 
They are disbelieving the testimony of the Holy Spirit. That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's calling the Holy Spirit a liar. And somebody, let me put it in really simple language, someone who, who gets to the end of their life and stands before God and says, I don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God and I don't believe he's the Savior, there's no forgiveness for that at the end. That's the only sin you can't be forgiven from. That The Holy Spirit says, here's the Savior, and you go, forget it. I don't buy it. John, John the Baptist, he's baptizing people. God has already told him, the guy you see the Spirit descend on like a dove, that's the guy. John's waiting. He's baptizing people. The Savior's coming. I know he's coming. I've been told to baptize. I've been told to do this. Jesus comes. He baptizes Jesus. Jesus comes out. The heavens are opened up. The Spirit descends like a dove. The voice speaks from heaven. This is my son. This is the one I'm pleased in. And John goes, I get it. This is the guy. This is the son of God. This is the Savior. And he rejoices in that. And the next day, he's like, hey, everybody. There he is right there. That's the guy. Listen, here's how he says it. This is John 1, 29. I love that it says this. Uh, it says, the next day, so this is after the baptism of Jesus. The next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I didn't know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he would be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, the one on whom you seen the Spirit descend and remain, that's the one who baptizes with the Spirit. I have seen and I have borne witness to this, that this is the Son of God. That brings us to our application. Every day for us, is an opportunity to declare, behold the Lamb of God. Every day for us is an opportunity to declare, behold the Lamb of God. Now listen, we're not all going to be prophets like John the Baptist was. You don't have to wear like camel hair and eat wild locust and honey. Um, you don't have to like hang out by the river, you know, or whatever, and just like be calling people serpents and brood of vipers as they're walking past you. Uh, but each of us, each of us, who has had the Spirit revealed to us that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior, each of us has the opportunity to every day go, look, that's the guy. We have that opportunity every day. Like, I, I want us, to, I want us to, to understand something. The difference, the, the difference in Peter, when, when Jesus got arrested, the last night of the life of Christ, Jesus gets arrested, and Peter's kind of following along to see what's going to happen to Jesus. And a woman walks up to him and she goes, you're one of his disciples, aren't you? And he goes, no, I don't know the guy. And then she goes, no, 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 I'm sure I've seen you with him. No, nope, I've never met him. And then somebody else comes up to him and says, no, 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 you're one of his followers. And he's like, look, I swear to you, I don't know him. And he begins to call curses down upon his own head. The difference between Peter there and Peter in Acts 2, 50 days apart, literally 50 days apart. The difference between Peter there and in Acts 2 where he gets up and he speaks to the multitude and he says, let me tell you who Christ is. Let me tell you who the Son of God is. The only difference is the Holy Spirit. And you have been given the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 says that those who belong to Christ have the Spirit of God in them. Ephesians 1.13 says that the Holy Spirit seals and marks all of those who have been marked for salvation. You have the Holy Spirit of God alive inside you, the one who declared to you, this is him, this is the Son of God, this is the Savior. There are a lot of things that we don't have to know to be Christians. You don't have to know how all the spiritual gifts work. You don't, you don't have to understand Hebrew language or Greek texts. You don't have to understand all the idioms, and you don't have to understand uh, the textus receptus, and you don't have to understand why King James Version has more verses than other versions, and you don't have to understand, like, you, there's a lot you don't have to understand. You don't have to understand the sacrifices, and, the, and you don't have to have ever read Leviticus, but you know what you do need to, to know to be saved? Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of mankind. You do need to know that. And the Holy Spirit, listen, I'm just going to tell you right now, I get a lot of things wrong. A lot of things wrong. Micah and I have been friends for 19 years. Pierce has been with us for a decade. Um, a little bit longer, I think, with you, right? Uh, Micah, something a little bit longer. But w w there are things that we're going to get wrong. I'm going to stand up in front of you. I I'll tell you this. There was something I, I thought I had learned a few weeks ago I was super excited about. I shared it with the Wednesday night Bible study two weeks ago, and they're like, no, you're totally wrong. And I was like, Oh, you're right. I'm wrong. Like, I'm wrong. 
You know what I've never changed my mind about and will never change my mind about? Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Savior of mankind. Why? Because the Spirit's job is to teach that. And the moment you put your faith in Jesus, you have the Spirit of God inside you. And I'm not sitting here going, man, sometimes I wonder if he's the Son of God. I've mentioned it in here before, and I hesitate to mention it because I don't want you actually reading this book. So I won't give you the title, but there is a stupid book by a stupid pastor uh, um, in Texas, who is not the guy you think it is, all right? It's not South Texas, it's Northeast or Northwest Texas. Anyway, it's not the guy you think it is. But there's a stupid book where this guy, this pastor says in his book, he goes, true Christians doubt the existence of God. I know, that's dumb. Thank you, Mary Beth. Like, what, right? <laughs> true Christians doubt the existence of God. No, no, no. Here's why they can't. Because the job of the Holy Spirit is to testify to the heart of the believer. Hey, that's the guy. He's the Savior. He's the Son of God. And when, once we've been sealed with the Spirit, and the Bible tells us in John chapter 3, we have the fullness of the Spirit. You didn't get a piece of him. You got all of him. And he's alive inside you. It is like this resounding voice, this beautiful... Ah, I'll tell you what. I haven't been there since I was 18, but my grandmother used to own 150 acres of land up in Canada on the Red Deer River. And, and I only went up there a few times as a, as a young man. And, and at night, especially in the summer, it was beautiful in the summer. And, and we were about 30 yards from this really big river. And you would lay in this log cabin at night and you would listen to the river just constantly. There wasn't anywhere you could go on the land that you didn't hear the river, you know, because the, the, her land ran right along the river. And you always heard it. It didn't matter what you were doing. You might get distracted for a little bit, but when you'd pause, you'd hear it. The Spirit of God is not silent. It's just like that river. And he is constantly saying, this is the guy. This is the Savior of the world. This is the Son of God. And it draws our attention to Jesus. And what it does then for us is it gives us the opportunity to tell other people, hey, that's the guy. How do you know? The Spirit told me. But how do you really know the Spirit told me? Yeah, but how do you know the Spirit told me that's the guy? Every single day of your life, you're going to bump into people who are broken. You're going to bump into people who are hurting. You're going to bump into people who are in devastating situations. And what we tend to do is we tend to go, and there's nothing wrong with like meeting somebody's physical need or providing some money or going, hey, look, we can let you borrow our car or whatever. But every day... You have the opportunity, just like John did. The, the, look, the next day, John could have kept doing his ministry and kept saying, let me back up. John's been saying, we don't know how long his public ministry was. John's been saying for the entirety of his public ministry, I'll baptize you with water, but there's another dude coming. He's better than me. I'll baptize you with water, but there's another dude coming. He's better than me. And the day after he baptized Jesus, and the day after God spoke, and the day after the heavens were opened up, and the day after the, the Spirit came down, John goes, that's the guy I've been telling you about. He didn't miss a beat. And then all of his followers were like, cool, man, we're going to go follow him now. And he's like, yeah, that's what you should be doing. I love it because, I told, like I told you, there's a couple of close buddies of John that come to him and go, all of our disciples are leaving to follow him. And he's like, awesome. He says, I've got a decrease and he's got an increase. Like my ministry served its purpose. My ministry was to prepare the way for him, but now he's here, so I'm done. Now my job is to go, that's the guy. How is it that we have come to have peace in the midst of our turmoil? How is it that we have come to have joy in the midst of our trial? How is it that we have come to have hope in the middle of loss? How is it that we have survived the things that we have survived as believers, that we have been able to pick ourselves up again? Because that's the guy. The Son of God, the Savior of the world, because my affection is set on him. How is it that if you're in the middle of a hellacious storm right now, how is it that you're going to get to the other side? That's the guy. And we have the opportunity. I, 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 people get the wrong impression about me when they only see me as a preacher. They, they think that I'm outgoing. I'm really not. I, I, don't, I don't want to talk to strangers. Um, like stranger danger is just like very much ingrained in my head. I'm nervous to talk to people. I am going to forget your names 40 times, which makes me super embarrassed to talk to you and ask you your name again. Like, I, I'm, I, I just, I'm not good at one-on-one. -on -one. This, super easy. All day long, let me do this. This is fine. 
talking to you afterwards makes me sweaty. <laughs> it does. Not because of anything you are, but like, I, I told Michelle, we were at the Cristobal football game the other night. There were a group of people standing over to the side, and one of the people uh, had posted a photograph recently on Facebook that I really wanted to paint. And so I, I went over to ask if I could paint this picture. And as I'm walking up to this group, I flash back to middle school, and I'm like, these are all the cool kids, and I'm the dork, and I can't talk to them, and I'm over there, and I'm like, hey, you know, and, I, and even though I wasn't doing it, I was kind of feeling like, I was like, oh, hey, um, so, you know, is it okay? And I just, I, like, this right here, there's like this invisible barrier right here. I have all sorts of confidence right here. Out there with you terrifies me. It just does. So people think that because I'm the preacher that it must be really easy for me to tell people that's the guy. It's not. Because to tell people that's the guy means i got to talk to strangers. So one of the things that I'm working on in my life, every day an opportunity to say that's the guy, every day an opportunity to point people, because the Spirit's pointed me, to be able to point people to Jesus every day, what I do is I look for one person in my goings that I can just bless in some way, that I can just speak to in some way. This is not the rule. This is insecure Ryan. You might be the person that talks to everybody. So don't fall on my model and go, man, I've been talking to 45 people a day and Ryan says it only needs to be one. No, 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 no. I'm broken, okay? If you're not, talk to everybody, okay? That's fine. But the point being that, that I look for ways to connect with the people around me. I, I'm, I'm trying to be mindful. I don't want to... Do you remember... Uh, those of you who are kind of in this age, I remember getting caller ID and how much I hated that because I got caller ID at our home about the time I was dating. And what you used to be able to do before caller ID, you'd be, you could call the girl and hang up because you needed to get a little more courage. But then caller ID ruined that because now she knows you called, <laughs> you know, and it's going to show up. She's going to get home. And there's going to be 45 missed calls from you, you know, and you're going to be like, ah. So what, what I would do is I would go to the 7-Eleven. I'm not kidding. And I'd use the pay phone because then she could call me back and I could, I could choose not to answer, you know, and then I could get up the courage and finally call her from my house. Like that was me. Right. And, and, and so like, uh, do you remember though? Like I remember I was one of the only people in 93 at Texas tech. I was one of the only people in the dorms that had an answering machine and you'd come home and you'd like, hope you had a message. You didn't know if your friends were going to have plans until you got back from class and like looked at the answering machine, you know? And, and now, like, now I don't want to talk on the phone. Just text me. You know, like, back then, everybody was, like, hoping that they'd get a phone call. And now we're like, oh, gosh, do I have to answer that? Just, just, just text me. Like, what, what is it you need to talk about? Like, it, text, you know? Like, so that's, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of like, let me be in my bubble and let me just kind of, but what, I, what I've realized, what I've realized is that every single person I interact with, and I know this is going to sound like a stupid, obvious realization, what I've realized is that every single person I come in contact with is a person for whom Christ died. Every single one. And I've gone, okay, don't think about this person from an insecure, Ryan doesn't want to talk on the phone, like, leave me alone, here's my bubble. It's not about quarantine or social distancing for me. It's just like, I have personal space, why are you in it kind of thing. Uh, don't think about people like that. Think about people like, this is someone that Jesus loves. And maybe this is someone who doesn't know that's the guy. We have an opportunity every day to say, behold the lamb. That's the guy. And the way we do our marriage and the way we raise our kids and the way we speak to strangers and the way we talk to the, the person who feeds us brunch, if you go to brunch after this, and the, the way that we live in this world gives us an opportunity every moment of every day to say, behold the lamb. And there is nothing more that the spirit inside of us wants to do than to say, behold the lamb. It's his whole job. And he has made it known to us, and it roars like a river in the background of our soul. And we want to be able to say to others, behold the lamb. John the Baptist had already encountered God. He knew about God. God had said, look, the guy's coming, the guy's coming, the guy's coming. John gets up and he's telling people, the guy's coming, the guy's coming, the guy's coming. He's dunking people, he's dunking people. The guy's coming, the guy's coming. And then Jesus shows up, he dunks him, he gets him out, the heavens open up, the dove descends, the voice says, this is my son. And John goes, there he is. 
Peter goes, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. The spirit comes and says, it's him. And Peter gets up and says, it's him. There he is. We have the spirit of God alive inside of us. Behold the lamb. Behold the lamb. If we need to start an insecure, socially awkward support group, I'm happy to do so. Please don't make me head it up. You know? We'll get somebody who, like Micah who has never had an insecure day in his life to be our captain, you know? It brings us to our prayer today. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and the spirit that you have given that reveals Jesus to us. God, thank you for your spirit, or for your son Jesus, and the spirit you've given that reveals Jesus to us. Would you take just a moment to pray that? Jot it down if you need to jot it down, and then just take a moment to pray that. God, we thank you for your son Jesus, and the spirit you have given that reveals Jesus to us. incredibly gracious God. God, before the world was formed, before Adam and Eve had sinned, your purpose, your plan was to send Christ, to reveal him to the nations, to through Christ bring salvation and righteousness and forgiveness. God, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for your spirit. Your spirit that has testified to us that Jesus is the son of God. For some of us, perhaps that was recently, it is this past year, we've come to the place where we say, that's the guy, Jesus is the son of God, the savior of the world. For others of us, it's been decades. We have walked long in the truth that Jesus is the son of God, the savior of mankind. Maybe for some of us in this room, God, it hasn't happened yet that your spirit has shown us and revealed to us the truth about Christ. But we thank you, God, for your testimony, that Jesus is your son in whom you are well pleased. We thank you for the testimony of the spirit that guides us into all truth, that reminds us of what Christ taught, reveals to us the truth of your goodness and your grace and your forgiveness. And God, we ask that you would make us the kind of people who would with boldness day to day declare, behold the lamb. That what the spirit has testified to our hearts, we would then testify to those around us. In our families, in our workplaces, amongst the strangers on the street. God, that we, having encountered the spirit, maybe even yesterday, would today, like John the Baptist say, behold the lamb. 